I'm Barry Farber, and although it is here, it is not widely known. It's not too late, if I talk fast, to become the Paul Revere uh, of neuro-linguistic programming, warning you not that the British are coming, but that NLP is already here. There are many first questions when you hear something as formidable as neuro-linguistic programming. Some people's first question is, did it come from California? Uh, do I have to take that if, I, if I've already taken est? Uh, is it good for you right away or only philosophically somewhere in the deep distant later on? Uh, what does it cost? Uh, what can it do? How long will it last? There is a bah humbug instinct when you hear anything like neuro-linguistic programming, and there are always starry-eyed people who try everything, including upside-down yoga, uh, and, and, and keep on trying it, who just line up with sleeping bags at the, at the headquarters of neuro-linguistic programming, wanting to get some fast and get some first. I'm trying to take a middle road, a balanced, reasoned approach, not a what the hell is this, but a, hey, let's look at here. Alison Kleiner uh, got me in that mood. I, I, wanna, I can't wait till I'm old enough to be a real codger and snarl and wave a cane uh, at things that call themselves neuro-linguistic programming. But Alison Kleiner, who's proven a very effective assistant in another organization I'm affiliated with in the language field, told me that she was, quote, into NLP. And I said to her politely, what's that? So let me say as politely now to the outside world, what's that? We've got some good accompaniment. I'm surrounded by the high command. They call this the Politburo of new <laughs> neuro-linguistic programming uh, in another context. They are the high priests. We have learned when something is new uh, and lustrous as NLP comes along, uh, not to take any chances. I want everybody in the room to introduce him and herself, uh, beginning with you, Allison, uh, with your NLP credentials. Okay, I'm Allison Kleiner, and I started out as a computer analyst, and NLP introduced itself to me, and it changed my whole way of looking at the world and now, come on, don't make it like a 19th century Sorry. medicine show. <laughs> no, maybe it'll change my whole way of looking at the world, too. <laughs> Steve. Hi, my name's Steve Drosnick, and I'm the training manager for the Merrill Lynch organization and the senior sales trainer. I found out about, Mer uh, about NLP about, oh, three years ago, enjoyed it tremendously, and found that it was the next logical step in communication that I could possibly pursue. I'm Linda Summer, co-director of the Eastern NLP Institute. We run trainings in Princeton and New York. We, I also do executive management consulting to many Fortune 100 companies, and I'm a consultant to the United States Army. And well, um, the United States Army? Yes, sir. About NLP? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Joe Yeager. I'm also co-director of the Eastern NLP Institute, and uh, I've been involved in it for about seven years. All right. The first rule of any kind of thing like this is... If there's a simple answer to the question, what is neuro-linguistic programming, it'll never sell. Uh, but, but is there, if not a simple answer, at least uh, an answer that most of us can ride along with? Um, I'd, I'd say it's a breakthrough in behavioral science and a breakthrough in the sense of the effects that we get by using it with people. Uh, if you compare it to the usual kind of psychology, say like uh, Freudian or behavioral experimental, um, most of them take quite a long time to get a result for a person who wants to do some behavior change. Or so this is therapy? This is mental health? Getting well, people over neuroses? That's one facet of it, but we mm -hmm. use it for business consulting to improve performance, to change the way people think and learn and behave, to interact. It's, uh, it's really the, the science of human nature. We finally found out how human nature works at the level we all experience it day to day. Mm -hmm. What does it have to do with therapy. I mean, if somebody is mentally troubled, does he now say, dear me, uh, shall I go to a psychiatrist? Uh, will a plain old therapist who's not an MD do? Shall I go to a Reichian, a uh, Freudian, a uh, behaviorist, or an NLP? I mean, uh, is, is that what they call a parallel construction? Um, I think, you know, from your, the point, that point of view, I think that's probably accurate. It's another behavioral science, but measured in terms of the way it operates, it's probably the most powerful one on the market right now. Uh, forgive me for intruding into your 
uh, way of life. Mm -hmm. But I thought uh, that NLP was something you all felt G was about. Well, Steve, you're in business. Why don't you tell us how you got exposed to it and what it did? Well, after about six years as an account executive, a salesman or a stockbroker for a Merrill Lynch organization, and then after another three years in the training and development section of Merrill Lynch, I had been exposed to a tremendous number of various courses. And in these courses, I thought I knew a lot about communication. And Barry, I found that when I took one of the introductions at NLP, that I had really realized less than 10% of what there was to communication. It takes communication and it makes it precise. For example, one of the things that I'll teach at Merrill Lynch to a series of students is how to have a person become comfortable with you in five minutes. The same level of comfort that normally takes an hour to an hour and a half to, to achieve. How people literally process information and how they think. All with the idea of facilitating the communications process. And it is the most powerful thing that I've ever been exposed to and I've been exposed to a lot. There, I've seen a course advertised in the name of NLP, in the name of Neuro Linguistic Programming, that promises how to make somebody fall in love with you within five minutes. Now, that's an exaggerated form of what you said. I wouldn't buy that because that's <laughs> obviously off the wall, but I might, buy, I, I might be suckered into a, into a seminar on how to make people as comfortable with you in how, how many five minutes did you say? About five minutes. Uh, as it normally takes for an hour and a half, yes. I wanted to mention, in regard to that article or that book, I was on a TV show in Philadelphia called People Are Talking because of that particular book. And what the skills will do is they won't make somebody fall in love with you, but they'll set the circumstances so that the person would take a second look so that they could be comfortable enough to find out whether or not there's more there. So it's not that someone can fall in love with you, but you can create that chemistry or you can create the circumstances for them to be comfortable enough with you to want to find out more about you. All right. I almost hesitate to ask because I'm always disappointed when something like this comes along. You try to open the package. Here we have a promise, folks. It's something called Neuro Linguistic Programming, which I guess most people smart enough to listen to a talk program have at least heard of. 50%, let's say, have heard of Neuro Linguistic Programming. And so I try to make them get specific. What can it do? And I'm told it's a new kind of therapy for those with mental disorders. That's number one. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's number one. And number two, most therapies only help you break even. Uh, I mean, if you think you have a cow inside you uh, and one of the uh, modalities of mental health, uh, one of uh, Freud, a psychiatrist, psychotherapist, counseling, can make you feel that you do not have a cow inside you, that's as good. You pay your money and you're happy. You were cured. No other therapy that I know of promises to make you feel uh, that you have a golden calf inside <laughs> you uh, or that you have some marvelous new fountain of youth inside you. If what I hear from you is correct, neuro linguistic programming not only helps you break even, but get yeah, ahead. Get ahead. Yes. How to make yeah, people absolutely. comfortable. Yeah, yeah. How to go from being a stark raven neurotic <laughs> to making people comfortable with you within a very few minutes. Now, it's been my experience as a broadcast that whenever there's anything that delicious, it's like trying to grab the greased pig at the county fair. I can never make anybody tell me how. I don't expect you to give me the well, seminar. Yeah, There's not well, time. But when we get back together, I want to know if you can lay bare some of the principles so that my listeners will have the right to say, aha, yeah, wait a minute, sounds okay. We'll be right back to that point. First, I'm Barry Farber, and let's suppose you don't know Spanish, and you want to correct that condition. Suppose I open up a school and you come to the desk and say, what does it cost? I tell you, that's okay. Uh, when are classes? Suppose I tell you, you say, that's okay. And suppose you say, oh, one more question. Just how do you endeavor to teach me Spanish? I'll show them a book. I'll show them lesson one. I'll tell them what the blackboard is. I'm going to write a verb. You're going to learn that verb. You'll learn a noun, to be, a pronoun to begin with. You'll learn a verb, uh, another verb, uh, how to put it together with a noun at the end, gender. Uh, and then you'll say, mm -hmm, oh, I see, you're going to unfold it for me. And I'll say, yeah. And then you'll probably sign up for the class because I've made you understand. I've taken the question mark and hammered it into an exclamation point. To your satisfaction, you understand what process will be applied to take you from the condition of not knowing Spanish over, overarchingly into the condition of knowing Spanish. There's no mystery. 
Now, when it comes to neuro-linguistic programming, and I have the high priests of neuro-linguistic programming, Steve Drysdeck, Dr. Joseph Yeager, Linda Summer, and Allison Kleiner. Let's see now. Let's just let me join the listeners. Let me see if they can show me any of the tools that I can touch and wave in the air uh, that they're going to give me so as to Here's the claim now, not make everybody fall in love with me within five minutes, although that has been advertised in the name of neuro-linguistic programming. I'll settle for second and third best. Let's see if they can just teach me how to make somebody more comfortable with me within five to 15 minutes instead of the normal period that it might usually take. Now, folks, you be my jury. You listen. I'm, going to, I'm not going to say a word for five minutes. That's going to be hard. I'm going to bite my tongue. You tell me if what happens now, you just decide in your own heart whether what happens now is specific or nailing a custard pie to the side of the barn. Well, the basic idea is to let a person know that you know where they're coming from and to understand in their, what we call the model of the world, that we know that model as well. Okay. Well, I, I have a different way of sort of thinking about it. I kind of look at it a little more technically. There are two aspects to anything that goes on with human nature. It's the part of us that interacts with other people, and there's the part that's inside your head, and those are the, uh, the thoughts and pictures and conversations you have internally with yourself. We work on both of these, and I think uh, to illustrate uh, Barry's point first, maybe Linda can give us an idea of how she uses body language to establish rapport and get this comfort level that we can achieve in just a few moments that some people might not get with a lifetime of friendship. So Linda, would you do that? Okay, well one, one example is matching body posture. What that means is when I walk into an office, when I'm working with an executive, they don't expect me because they expect somebody who is older, they, expect, they don't expect a woman. And very often they'll tell me that women don't belong in business, yet I'm their consultant. So the first thing I'll do when I walk into an office is I'll match body posture. Now, NLP is not an invention. It's a discovery. It already exists. If you ever go to a ball game and you watch all the people sitting across, they all look as though they look alike. They might be leaning forward. And if you look from person to person to person, you might notice that they all have the same posture. When you have rapport proof and those of us in New York City know how nice it would be if you could go from room to room and not hear any noises in the city unless of course you opened the windows and wanted to hear them each room is very soundproof so that you didn't hear what was going on from apartment to apartment you'd probably tell yourself as you enjoyed either the quiet or the various sounds of the city that this is the house for you the third house this one gives you that feeling of being home it's the type of house that you can give your personal touch, where you can sit in a room and really get a feel for yourself and where you are. You'll know when you, when you walk in this house and the feelings that you'll get that this is the house for you. Now, which house did you choose and why? Did you know that all three houses were the same? The only difference was in the first house, I only used picture words, seeing words. In the second house, I only used sound words. And in the third house, I only used feeling words. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is, in the beginning, Allison has said that we met, match people in their model. What that means is that we meet people where they are most comfortable first, and then we bring them over to where, where, we, where we want them to go. So in this demonstration, we're going to show you how a conversation, if you match predicates, sounds very different than if you mismatch predicates. Can I add something here, Linda, sure. before you get started? Uh, what I was thinking about is to give you a sort of an example that will uh, give you a sense of why this is important. Uh, part of neurolinguistic programming's background comes from computers and computer programming. And what we found out is that the mind processes information in certain ways. And uh, now most of you have seen cars out in the street and you know that basically, uh, let's say a gasoline powered car and a diesel car are essentially the same kind of vehicle. They have engines and plumbing and all that good stuff. And the difference between a gasoline ca powered car and a diesel car is essentially about 5% of the plumbing. But anybody who's got common sense knows that if you put diesel fuel in a gasoline car, vice versa, you're gonna gum up the works. So what happens is, is when you're communicating with another person, if they have a preferred system for thinking in pictures, or if they prefer thinking in sounds, or even some people prefer thinking in feelings, and they would tend to call it intuition, 
one of the things you have to notice if you want the communication to go well is pay attention to their preferred system of thinking. And if you just re uh, return your conversation to them in the same system, you'll find all of a sudden the rapport and the comfort level just skyrockets and everything just goes along terrifically. Okay? Where, where this has been real useful in my life is when I used to work with a boss and she used to tell me about all the projects and what was supposed to be done. I never understood why I didn't understand totally. Finally, I realized I needed a picture. I needed a chart. And once I realized that, I said, OK, show me the report. Show me the chart. And then I knew exactly what she was talking about. Mm. OK, Steve and I are going to demonstrate it and see if you can get a feel or you can hear a difference between the dialogues based on when we're matching predicates or when we're mismatching. Forgive me, in case somebody just tuned in, uh, this broadcast has not flown off its moorings uh, into a typhoon. Uh, I'm Barry Farber, and I'm just a student sitting closest to the blackboard now. We are getting instruction in something new and promising uh, called neuro-linguistic programming, and we've got the four horsemen of neuro-linguistic programming <laughs> right here, and I'm going to get out of their way and let them program neuro-linguistically a little bit more. This is going to be first mismatching. Linda, I just wanted to tell you about a wonderful show that um, Allison was telling me about the other day. She said that the sound was absolutely fantastic and that people were talking about it left, right, and center. You're kidding. What did you see? Well, it's not, I, I didn't see anything, but the people who have been saying that this is fantastic and the discussions left, right, and center have been outrageous. And Allison said that it's fantastic. Is it one of the shows I should go, I should go take a look at? Well, I think you should, you know, listen Listen to me at least carefully and uh, learn more about it. Well, what were they focusing in on in that show? I suppose. Um, the okay. Sound. Now, did you hear where where the pauses came in? We're going to do the same dialogue again, only this time we're going to match systems. Linda, I was just listening to a show the other day. In fact, uh, Allison was telling me about a show that she had heard about, and people were discussing it left, right, and center. They say that it's fantastic. Oh yeah. What was the What was it like? I mean, what was the sounds like? What kind well, of music did they well, have? The music was really upbeat and really starting to move along, and it was really snappy, the type of thing, and it was a lot of fun. Okay, it sounds great. Yeah, it really is. Allison and people left, right, and center were really suggesting and discussing it. Can't tell you more enough about it. it. Sounds like a really good show. I really think I'd like to go. I'd like to discuss it more with you first. Thank you. Because I really want to know the sound system. I want to know if you could hear from every place in the show, you know, yeah. what it was like, if you could listen and, and hear exactly what the author was trying to do. Hmm. I think that's a great idea. Okay, in one you got more information, even though it's very brief in this moment, and in the other there was more static. So whether you're working in education, and I want to do one little metaphor. I met a woman on the train who was with the Board of Education, and I got rapport with her first by matching body posture and then by using visual predicates. As soon as I asked her a question in auditory, she stopped talking to me. And she also told me about all the personality conflicts in school. And every child who she said was a problem child or a learning disabled child was a child whose primary system was auditory, which didn't match her visual system. And that we found very fascinating. One more brief thing when we talked about pacing and leading, Allison and I are going to show you matching and mismatching and pacing and leading and let us know which one feels better. Yeah. Okay. First, mismatching. Okay. Often, often people, when they come into a uh, new situation, tend to talk fast. And so, Linda? Well, I really think that if people are really listening, they should talk more slowly so that everybody could hear them. Really? What would they say? They would probably say that, you know, like if someone was really talking fast and the other person was really talking slow, I don't know how long you'd really want to listen to me if I did it this way. Oh, well, I don't know. I honestly don't really... Right now, I don't feel like talking that much. Now, how many of you would tune into that and listen for a long time if there was such a mismatch? Now, Allison and I are going to be matching. One of the things that happened on the last weekend was you did a talk with a group of folks. What did you teach? Well, what I taught about was how to create a well-formed outcome for yourself, how to decide what is right all the parameters that one should consider in a neuro-linguistic sense about what is what would be the right outcome. The you mean the outcome that somebody would want? Yeah, the outcome that someone would want. For instance, if you're in the business world and you're not real happy, mm -hmm. and for instance, you might think, well, there's all sorts of alternatives for me to go to. And well, maybe one is um, just leaving freelance. Another might be to to 
get a new boss, for instance. Okay. I'm sure you're able to pick up the difference when we were matching at the same rate and when we were mismatching. The trick of this is if you're with someone who's either talking too slow or too fast, if I can use a metaphor of what happened with the David Letterman show, he was pacing a woman. Natural pacing is sometimes verbally, but also sometimes non-verbally. And the way he paced this actress was with his head nods. And he started pacing her, but she was talking like this, and soon enough her head started going so... His head went up and down so quickly that he went back in the chair and lost rapport. Okay, when we get back together, uh, let's see if we have <clears throat> enough uh, on the table uh, to uh, build a pyramid upon. First... I'm Barry Farber, sitting in the jury box of uh, neuro-linguistic programming and looking with great interest upon this phenomenon, which is catching on and interesting an awful lot of people and major companies as one of the greatest communication tools. As a matter of fact, one of our panelists called it a communications breakthrough. He's Dr. Joseph Yeager. Steve Drozdek heads up neuro-linguistic programming training for Merle Lynch. Allison Kleiner, and why, why is there so much laughter? Is this a mismatch? Yes, because he utilizes NLP. He's the vice president of training and development for Merrill Lynch. Oh. And he utilizes the skills of NLP I for Merrill Lynch. It. And he doesn't pitch a tent outside and put right. NLP on top. <laughs> and, uh, right. and I teach it to a number of people in voluntary sessions. Interestingly, the people who enjoy it the most, people with 10, 15 years sales experience, wonder why they had never learned about this before. It's a relatively new development that allows the communication process to occur very, very rapidly, very, very effectively. And it occurs on two levels, not only with you and other people, but you or me and myself. That is, I can feel comfortable on the phone. I can feel comfortable talking with others. And that's something that uh, Dr. Yeager later on will be discussing a little bit more fully the internal states so that we can literally get virtually anything that is in our control to achieve. All right, my Spanish students are going to know <clears throat> how to say. Um, uh, they're going to have to, they're after a, a class, they're going to know how to ask for a panecillo con mantequilla, a <laughs> roll with butter, tangible, three-dimensional. They can grab it, they can eat it, they can chew it, give them nutrition. When your yeah. students graduate, I sort of have the feeling that it's like one of these karate schools where on paper and on videotape everything works fine but you get up against that vicious drunk in the alley and it all goes like a sand castle on a beach when the tidal wave hits. Uh, how applicable is what you learn in basic training in neuro-linguistic programming when you get out on the front lines and the guns are blaring? Well, I think <laughs> pretty good examples you give. Um, it, the thing about NLP is that it works everywhere with everyone because it really is simply how human nature works. and. Uh, uh, in, say, everyday terms, two of the things we work with all the time are what uh, people would consider to be habits uh, or personality characteristics like willpower. And uh, a lot of people, for instance, who want to lose weight or stop smoking always blame, well, I just don't have the willpower or something like that, or the habit is too strong. Well, what we found out is that those skills and smoking and overeating and so on are skills. You've learned to do them. People don't think of them that way. They tend to think of them maybe as pathology. Uh, what we found out is how those things work. And basically, the mind works on images. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the mind perceives through the five senses, sight, sound, touch, smell, and taste. And what happens is, is that, um, for instance, if you look around the environment you're sitting in right now and uh, close your eyes, you'll have an image of it in your mind. Well, your mind records images through all five senses. And the way behavior operates is, in a sense, very similar to how we dial up a telephone number. Um, behavior internally inside your mind comes in strings or sequences of pictures and sounds and feelings and various combinations that uh, typically when we dissect them the way you used to dissect a sentence in seventh grade English we can break a thought pattern down and blueprint it and find out where a thought pattern goes wrong for instance if you have a habit that you want to break we'll be able to literally dissect it out into little parts by watching very tiny important cues in your body language, in your tones, your choice of words, your rate of breathing, your eye movement, and all kinds of cues that you're giving off all the time. You're constantly communicating with your environment. And what we, in a sense, have learned to do is to encode and map what's typical behavior and find out how to change it very, very easily. So we can change a habit by finding the string of, sequen of images internally that go on 
inside your mind and we can find one of those images and change it. And I'll give you an idea of just how simple it is once you know how. Now I'm not going to suggest that you try these on yourself because the technology is literally a technology. It's very extensive and some of what we do is probably at least as complicated as brain surgery, at least organic chemistry, because we have to map all this stuff out. But take the audience, for instance, now if, if everybody has uh, uh, seen the American flag and just as I mention it and ask you to think of it, it pops to mind. Now, more than likely, most of the folks in the audience are going to have some sort of a favorite flower. It might be a tulip or a rose or whatever, but that'll also come to mind as well. And in fact, you can't not think of these things as I bring them up. For instance, can you not think of a pink elephant? It comes to mind. You can't not do it. Well, these ways that perception work uh, are the kinds of tools we work with. So what happens is, let's take that flag and the flower. Now, what I'd like you to do is just replace all the stars on the flag with flowers. And there, just as quickly as I ask you to do it, it happens in, in most cases. Some people have to think about it for another moment or two because they may be talking to themselves first. But what will happen is that a year from now, if I come back and ask you to remember that flag with flowers on, it'll still be there. You have learned from one original image of a flag and another image of a flower. You put them together and you have a third image. That's literally how a mind is changed. That's how you change your own mind. You string together these images, you repackage them, you reformulate them, you bring up maybe that image of the flag for some people is right up front in their face. For others, it's way off in the distance, waving on a pole. For some people, it's behind them in their mind's eye. What we find are all these characteristics of distance and size and location and motion. Uh, just in the visual system alone, there are comparable characteristics in auditory and feeling system. We go around and find out how these images string together in their characteristics rearrange them and we change thought patterns and skills and creativity and so on. And there's one young lady who voiced fear to me. She went to a seminar in neuro linguistics programming and she said, Barry, anybody can use this and become a Hitler. This stuff is dangerous. When we get back together, I want to know your comment thereupon. First, <coughs> it's a big testimonial to neuro linguistic programming that an intelligent person can f fear that it's uh, an instant formula instant recipe to becoming an Adolf Hitler if that's what you want to do. Uh, how do you view the so-called danger or power of what it is you're dealing with? Well, I have a particular view on that. I'm asked that question an awful lot and uh, I think it's a very well-intentioned question and deserves a really good answer. Uh, part of it is that NLP is a tool and uh, say like a scalpel for a surgeon, it's uh, used by someone who's qualified. It literally is a tool. It does, does good. You put it in the hands of Jack the Ripper and it is a weapon. So the technology of NLP is straightforward neutral. It's discovered by scientific method. It's been expanded by scientific method. Uh, so you have to question yourself, is, is NLP dangerous or are the people who use it dangerous? It's, uh, it's a matter of trust. And you decide that the same way you decide to trust anyone or anything in any other circumstance. And it's interesting also that one time I was sitting in a place with a friend of mine and I saw somebody who I thought would be real interesting and I said, I'd like to meet that person. He looks very, very interesting. And before, before either of us knew it, that person came over to us. There was something that oh, I did. You mean you can pick up girls with NLP? As we said, <laughs> you can make anybody feel more comfortable mm. with you very quickly. You know, I sort, of think of, I sort of think of it, Barry, as a being a positive influence in somebody's life. For example, going back to what Joe had said, don't think of a pink elephant, basically what happened is that the unconscious had to think of a pink elephant. Now consider most of the words that we use in normal conversation. We tell kids, don't drop the glass right on the floor, because their mind had to access what it was to drop it and then, in co and then consciously say, don't, or don't fall down, and they fall. How about when we tell people, don't worry, what do you mean, I shouldn't worry, there's nothing to worry about, and they access unconsciously a state of worry. So what we would suggest is something like this, tell the person what you would like. Barry, I'd like you to feel comfortable, and I'd like you to feel good. I'd like you to carry that glass carefully because an entirely different set of internal mental images is brought up and you become that positive influence. Well, what you'll find out is that as you talk to your friends, if you will start to pay real close attention to little grimaces and gestures and blinks of the eyes and a certain look, the expressions you recognize that tell you that they're in a certain kind of mood, 
you'll find that virtually every word and sentence you use is going to bring up a particular expression. And one of the interesting findings of NLP is that we can produce an instant conditioned response. Because what happens is, in opposition to a lot of the other uh, research in psychology that sort of assume that it takes a long time to condition a response, 10 or 12 or 15 tries to teach your dog to sit up for a milk bone and so on, what we've learned is that uh, when you ask a person to say, recall a horrible experience, they'll give you an instant replay in miniature of that entire experience and the whole thing will replay in their mind's eye and you'll be able to see it on their expression. Now, that's a, a response, and what we do is when we want to condition a new response is ask them to start thinking of competing positive thoughts and so on, and there are particular procedures we use to make sure that the positive response overwhelms the negative one, and we build in, essentially, a conditioned response to feel positive in whatever the circumstance happens to be. Our time is exhausted. Our curiosity is not. Let me thank Steve Drozdick of Merrill Lynch, Dr. Joseph Yeager, co-director, Allison Kleiner, and uh, thank her for being my native guide into this new territory of NL. It's not NLP that made my voice like it is. It's what's going to get it better by, by the next broadcast. And thanks to Linda Summer, management consultant. Suppose listeners want to learn more about NLP. Uh, who do they call? Okay, there's two numbers that you can call. We have one here in New York, which is at my office at 212 666 7505. That's 666-7505. In Pennsylvania, in eastern Pennsylvania, the Eastern NLP Institute is located, and their number is area code 215-860-0911. 215-860-0911. Or you can write to the Institute at P.O. Box 697, Newtown, Pennsylvania, 18940. Newtown, Pennsylvania, what now? 18940. 18940. Okay, uh, would you give all those numbers once again at dictation speed? Okay. 212-666-7505. That's in New York, in Pennsylvania. 215-860-0911. And uh, the address? P.O. Box 697, Newtown, Pennsylvania, 18940. Okay, upon this we write not the end, but to be continued. I'm Barry Farber. Keep asking questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks.